Marie Kexet here from Century 21 Canada. It is Tuesday, April 7th, and I wanted to mention the date because things with this COVID-19 pandemic are changing so quickly. I think it's important to establish what day it is because the topic we're talking about is also changing on a regular basis. And it's about government relief measures and different programs that are available to both employers and employees. We have David Black from the Canadian Franchise Association with us today. He is the Director of Government Relations, and he is on top of all of these details. David, thank you for being here. I know that you've been taking a big look at everything. You guys are in charge of or keeping an eye on things for 50 different sectors, real estate being one of them. And Things also change province by province, so I know you're going to give people an overview of all of the different things going on on a federal level, but also a provincial level. So I will turn it over to you for your update. Perfect. Thanks, Lee. Uh, so I'm Dave Black, the GR Director at the CFA. Now, franchising across the country, as Lee mentioned, we have about 50 different sectors. It's about 1.9 million employees, and it's worth over, well, at least before the before COVID-19 hit was worth about $100 billion to the GDP and the realty sector is a, is a big part of that. So I'm going to walk you through a presentation that's going to go through all of the federal programs that are available um, that have been come out recently, some of the business supports there, some of the individual supports, and then I'm going to go province by province. The caveat I'm going to put on everything I say, it's correct as of the moment that I speak it because Government is changing these programs on the fly. Normally, some of these programs would take six to eight months to develop and another six to eight months to roll out. In a lot of these cases, these programs are going from beginning to end in 10 days, and the demand is enormous. So that's the caveat that I put there. I have my contact details at the back of this presentation. So if you do have any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to answer them as best I can. So I'll just start through there. So this is the outline of how I'm gonna go through it. So in terms of the business supports, a big one for businesses is this Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy. So this is a 75% subsidy on the wages that you paid. So it also includes bonuses that you might make um, and any other type of income. There's a detailed link I will include on the next slide. It's up to a maximum 847 per week. So what they're going to do is, if your business has declined more than 30% between comparing March 2019 to March 2020, and then comparing April to April, April 2019 to April 2020, et cetera, they'll, re they'll rebate you up to 75% of the salaries that you've paid. Now, there was a cap on it of about $58,000 per organization. As of two days ago, that cap seems to have been removed, which is great. So if you had 50 employees, it would be 847 a week per 50 employees. Now, in terms of eligibility, like I mentioned, you have to have seen your business decline by 30%. But when you compare March 2019 to March 2020, and they've done it over three claiming periods. Now, to get this subsidy, you do have to apply every month. It's administered by the CRA, so you will have to go through comparing your 2019 tax return to 2018 or your revenues. You're going to have to prove that you've seen a drop in business, and then they'll rebate the money to you. Like I said, in terms of how it's gonna work, so I think everybody would have a, a My Business Portal account with the Canada Revenue Agency. So that's how it'll be administered. You would apply for it, CRA would grant you an approval for that particular month. You pay your payroll taxes and that as you would normally uh, in a business situation. And then between three and six weeks, they will rebate you the money that you paid for for April or May. So here's an example just of how the, and this is a general example that they put out there. It's not a realty specific, obviously, but if you've got that company with the total payroll of 5,600, your revenues are down. You can see what the subsidy would be. It would be about $4,200. So 
after the subsidy is applied and you get the check back, your net payroll for that particular month would be about only $1,400. So that, that's designed to help keep businesses afloat. Another wage subsidy program that you may have heard about is this 10% wage subsidy. So this is for all employers across all classes. Even if your business has gone up, you are still able to claim this 10% wage subsidy. And it's up to a maximum of $13.75 per employee and $25,000 per employer. So, and these are both temporary programs that apply for March, April, May into June, not beyond June as of yet. So they put a limit on that. You don't need to apply for this temporary wage subsidy. It's a self-administered subsidy, which means you do all your calculations for payroll, like income tax, CPP, EI, et cetera. And instead of sending 100% of that money to the Canada Revenue Agency, you only send 90% of that to them. So you get to keep that 10% in your pocket the one very important piece to keep in mind is you can't reduce your remittances for CPP or EI premiums. You must continue to pay those for yourself, assuming you pay, you pay CPP and EI, but you must continue to remit those moving forward. And again, here's another example. Because there's a cap, that's why I've included this. So you take that eight eligible employees, the monthly payroll of about 38,000, so that's a $3,800 subsidy. You know, for that three-month period, there, you would have $114,000 in pay in payroll. You're under the 10%. You would get $11,400 back because there is an $11,000 cap. That's what you'd be capped at. Now, between these two subsidy programs, you can actually stack them. And what government is going to do in the background? So, if you claim the 10% subsidy. You remit 90% of your payroll taxes, and you also have seen that business decline by 30%, you can apply for the, the other subsidy. And in the background, government will say, they'll give you your money up front, and then they'll claw it back on the employment wage subsidy on the 75% one. So they'll, they've agreed to do that in the background. As of right now, again, program things keep changing, so just keep an eye on that. In terms, this may not be as applicable uh, in the real estate space, but so there is, they have extended a work sharing program. So this allowed companies to have two employees share effectively the same job. So they would both stay employed and work an equal number of hours. It was initially designed for the forestry sector and the fishing sector, but it's now been expanded to a whole host of other employment, to basically every employment sector and they've extended the duration. So it used to be capped at 38 weeks. Now it's been extended to 76 weeks. I will post this on the CFA website and I can send Lee a copy of it, the link and she can circulate it to everybody who's on the webinar. So you can get access on the detailed program. There is about a seven page document um, on that link about what this work sharing program is, how it works and how you might apply. Now there's a number of loan programs that are also available. So this was announced probably around March 18th and it's called the Business Credit Availability Program. It's broken into two, a couple of different streams. So the first one is a loan guarantee for SMEs that's run by Economic Develop Export Development Canada, sorry, EDC. And so that's just for the operating credit for cash flow term loans. And then we've got this co-lending program that's run by the Business Development Bank of Canada, so BDC.ca. And those are term loans just to help you cover your operational cash flow requirements as during the downturn. Now the program have started to roll out. It's after March 28th, I believe it was. Um, so that is rolled out. To access these programs, you have to work through your existing financial institution. So work through the, the bank. I know most companies have bank have accounts with a whole bunch of different banks. Work through the one that you have your primary day-to-day -day business account. That's where everybody is being suggested to. Don't try and shop around banks. Go to where you've got your day-to-day -day business banking. And the one issue that we are working on at CFA is the BDC currently requires personal guarantees from the borrowers. 
And so we're working to amend that requirement so that it'll be, the loan would be granted on the strength of the business, not with that personal guarantee backstop. Given how difficult the economy is right now, we don't think that's a reasonable uh, ask that that have that personal guarantee. The other one that you've probably heard about in the news is this Canada Emergency Business Account, or it's the $40,000 loan, um, as the media has been putting it. So it's a maximum of $40,000. It's interest-free, government-guaranteed to help you cover the operational costs that cannot be deferred. And that's an important nuance, that it's, it's not a renovation fund. It's not for expansions. It's to cover those operating costs that you can't defer, so rent, some salary dollars, et cetera. Of that 40,000, if you pay the 30,000 of it back by the end of March, 2022, the government will write off 10% of that loan. So you effectively will get $10,000 in your pocket. If you can't write it, if you can't pay it off in that time period, it just gets converted into a simple three-year term loan at an interest rate of 5%. It's a pretty straightforward piece. The one challenge we're finding right now with this program is it's based on corporate entities, not on locations. So in the franchise business sector, you have some companies that own multiple locations, but under one corporate entity. So they're, not a, they're only able to tap into one loan, not five or six for each of their locations. Now, to qualify, for this loan you need to as it says there you have to have salaries are paid between fifty thousand and one million dollars in payroll and that is based on your t4 sum of summary of remuneration then you filed with your 2019 corporate tax return if you haven't paid fifty thousand dollars in t4s um, and i know some businesses they pay themselves through uh, investment income or and have T5s or T4A slips that are issued. It has to be some, the calculation right now is based on what that number is in that 2019 T4 sum summary remuneration line in your tax return. Again, like I said, it can be used to pay for operating expenses, you know, payroll, rent, utilities, insurance, et cetera. You do apply through your business, your, your financial institution. And again, as I said, we've got that one corporate entity that we are trying to change uh, and we'll hopefully open that up. It's a very live discussion with government. They policies and programs are changing daily. So we're hopeful. I keep harassing people. One that I think a lot of you will be interested in is the business tax deadlines have been pushed. So if you're in a self-employed situation with a spouse, common law partner, your filing date remains June 15th. That's the date it's always been. But if you owe any taxes, that has been pushed to September 1st, 2020 to give you a little bit more cash in your pocket for June, July, and into August. But it's not a, they're not writing it off. It is just a, the deferral until September 20th, September 1st. You won't pay any interest on waiting until September 1st, sorry. Uh, for a corporation, the tax year has been pushed, so it's June 1st now. That's been extended out. And that's only for corporations that have a filing date between March 18th and June 1st. So if you had a filing date based on your tax year of March 1st, unfortunately, the filing date is sticks, but your payment date will be put has been pushed to September 1st as well. And that's for any balances or installments that came due after March 18th. So if you did have an installment due on March 15th, you should have paid that. Uh, if you had an installment date on March 19th, obviously you get it pushed to September 1st. And again, there's a link to all the tax filing deadlines and I'll get into the personal tax side of it uh, shortly. They've also deferred the sales tax remittance to CRA. So as you see, as you can see on the screen, they've done it based on the types of filer you are. So if you're a monthly filer, it's all your remittances are pushed for February, March, and April. Quarterly, it's January through to March. And annual filers, it's been pushed as well. So all of those payments are deferred until June 30th. Now keep in mind again that that's a deferment, it's not a write-off. So make sure you have that cash in your account so that you can make those payments on June 30th. So if there's a way, 
if you're using that cash immediately, just know that you're going to have to pay that and there will be penalties if you miss those deadlines under the current program. And now we get into this, this is the assistance they're providing for individuals. So the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, you may have seen on the news, it started taking applications yesterday. So it's a taxable benefit, it's 2,000 bucks a month for up to four months. And again, it's the eligibility criteria outlines here below. So you have to have stopped working. So one of the big questions we always get is, I'm still working, can I collect? It's like, no, you have to have stopped working. And the second bullet is very important. It was a give to the retail sector. A lot of workers in the retail sector were nervous about their health and thought, hey, I can quit my job and collect EI or this $2,000 a month. Unfortunately, government has said that you cannot voluntarily quit your job. If you quit your job, you don't get any of the, it's as though you quit your job outside of a COVID-19 crisis. So it does put you in a bit of a difficult spot. Um, you have to have had income of at least 5,000 in 2019. That income can come from a host of different sources and does not have to be done, made in Canada. So if you do have friends, family, or if you made income overseas that was above $5,000, that will help you become eligible for this program and then you have to have stopped working. You know, here's just a little Q&A that we put together with uh, the federal government. So I answered the first one. In terms of the EI benefits or the emergency response benefit, a lot of people are asking, which should I apply for if you're eligible? The federal government is suggesting everybody apply for the CERB and they will sort out within government which one you should apply to and which one you should get. So go through that one portal. Um, in terms of how to apply, it's through Service Canada. If you go online, it's a very user-friendly website. Um, that number is out of date. I just heard in the background. So yesterday they processed 960,000 applications. Um, so that was a number at about 11 o'clock yesterday. So they, they're up to 960 yesterday, and I'm not sure what the number is yet today. Some of the other measures that are available to people so they are increasing the Canada Child Benefit to $300 a year, so that can help, and that's gonna be paid more quickly. There's the one-time GST credit for those who are eligible, so that's being bumped up, and that money should be flowing in April. And then you may have seen in the news the mortgage support, so the banks are offering mortgage deferment. That is a, it's been well received, but it is a complicated process working with the banks. They say they've granted about half a million mortgage deferments, but it's a, there's a lot of people complaining that the banks are being more difficult. The federal government is working with them to try and ensure money is flowing. Uh, the feds put a lot of money into the banks, into the liquidity of markets so that they can keep loaning money out. But we're waiting to see how that plays out. And again, this is the personal income tax filing. So. We all were supposed to have done our tax return, I guess it's the end of April, so that's now been pushed to June. And if you have any monies owing, that's been pushed to September 1st. So that just gives you a bit more time to figure out where your personal situation is and go from there. This one I think is a big interest to a lot of you, uh, commercial rent relief. One of the challenges that everybody's finding is it's provincial responsibility for the Landlord Tenant Act and all of the Commercial Tenancy Acts across the country. I know there's a number of franchise businesses that are not able to pay their, their rent in April or may have asked for a deferment. The CFA is working with a number of organizations across the country and governments to try and create a rent deferral program, a write-off program with each province to help people through this period. So Nova Scotia created a rent deferral program about, I think it was March 27th, they created the program. Originally franchise businesses weren't included, but they are now, I spent the, that weekend doing it, so they now are. PEI has copied and pasted the Nova Scotia program, and so that's up and running. And New Brunswick banned eviction. So if you do have a commercial client who is saying, oh, they didn't pay their rent for April, we should just evict them. In a lot of cases, there are bans on evictions right now. New Brunswick is that case, but 
There's also the sheriff's office and the bailiff's office, whoever would serve those no writs of eviction are actually closed, so that's preventing it. And there's also rules in some provinces about the seizure of goods within a property. So it's something to be aware of and just be careful of as you go forward. Again, at the bottom, what you can see what CFA is advocating for. Now I'm gonna go through all of the provincial programs that exist across the country. And I'm just gonna go from west to east. Apologies if you're not in any of some of these jurisdictions, but it was the easiest way to do it because I know we've got people from across the country. So in terms of BC, they put about $1.1 billion into supporting for supports for people as they're calling it. So that's the new emergency benefit for workers. So it's, and these are on top of the federal programs. Um, there's also the climate change action tax credit. So that's giving additional money. Those of you who have cars in BC and pay ICBC, they are deferring payments up to 90 days right now. It's not clear if they're gonna allow a write-off in the future or if that may be extended. This program was announced about a week and a half ago, so the world has changed quite a bit in 10 days. In terms of the supports for business, obviously they, your payroll taxes, are you don't have to remit those until September. Um, if you have less than 500,000 income, you are already exempt, so that's great. Um, and then all the commodity taxes have been pushed and they're deferring some of the tax increases that had been scheduled to come online on April 1st. So that's the, it doesn't really affect the realty sector, but they put a PST on sweetened carbonated drinks. And so those are gonna be deferred outwards. And in terms of Alberta, um, Premier Kenny and the Alberta government has put in place deferrals of the education property tax, and they are going to be paying that on behalf of some of the municipalities. That's a way of keeping money in the pockets of landlords with the objective that those landlords will pass on those savings to their tenants. Be careful. I would advise some of your landlords that you may work with. Um, if landlords don't pass this on, Premier Kenny has signaled he may get a little more aggressive with how he treats them. So it was done as a, here's some money now so that you can pass that on to your tenant your commercial tenant. Um, if you don't, and if, if landlords are being, uh, I know everybody's in a tough situation, but it's one of those just be careful of what premier can, what might come next. They've also deferred a lot of the workers' comp payments uh, for 2021 and income tax deadlines as well. Now in Saskatchewan, again, it's more about, most of these are focused on people and taxes. There hasn't been a lot of work a lot of stuff announced for the commercial or residential real estate market. So, you know, provincial taxes and tax returns have been pushed. All the utilities across the country have put in deferments and so you can delay bills that are coming in and the workers comp premiums are being deferred. And the list of critical services, the first link on that is changing quite regularly across the country. So. If you are not sure if you're a critical service, check the, each of the websites or feel free to send me an email and I can send you some of the links. They are changing regularly, so make sure you stay up to date. There are some fairly severe penalties if you are not an essential business and you are still continuing, so just to be, just to be careful of that. Manitoba's done a little bit. It's more about, like I, it says, the tax filing deadline extensions have been pushed out. They haven't provided much in additional supports. They are working with the federal government and the premiers to try and get the feds to borrow a significant amount of money and then provide it to the provinces for economic development programs that will aid in the recovery. And so you'll read in the news later today, there's a letter coming from Premier Pallister on that topic. In Ontario, they did their budget in late March, it was more of an economic update. And so they're providing a lot of interest-free periods on provincially administered taxes, et cetera, and the WSIB premiums. Ontario's also reduced the electricity rates. Most provinces have put deferments on bills and stopped people and will, they will not shut off electricity if you have a non-payment of bill for the next couple of months. Ontario went a little bit further 
and reduce the electricity rate to its off-peak rate of 10.1 cents a kilowatt hour. So if you are on that billing cycle, then you will you should see a decrease in the amount you're paying per kilowatt hour. Again, your your home electricity may have gone usage may have gone up because we're all on the phone and on webinars all day. Uh, in terms of Quebec, they've done a number of things for supports. Again, most of it is focused on those tax filing deadlines. There are temporary aids for workers to help them self-isolate, and that's on top of the federal programs that exist. And last Friday, all the days are starting to blend together for me. Last Friday, they announced a new $150 million program for medium-sized businesses. So that will help provide that 50,000 in assistance um, and it's available for capital across a whole bunch, all the business sectors. They've also extended those local investment funds until the end of December, 2022. And that's the main vehicle that municipalities use for economic development. So that'll help get the regions of Quebec back on their feet, not just the Montreal and the Quebec City region. In terms of New Brunswick, uh, again, it's a lot focused on taxes. So they're waiving late penalties on property taxes. And they've also pushed the interest and principal payments on loans, on provincial loans. So that's good news for people. They do have some operating loans for small businesses that you may be able to take advantage of. And those are operated through op Opportunities New Brunswick, their economic development agency. And in terms of evictions and commercial and residential uh, tenancies, under their state of emergency, they have banned those until the end of May. In Nova Scotia, again, they've, they've banned that and they've also created this rent deferral program. So it'll allow you to defer that rent for up to three months if the business is forced to close under the public health order. If the business was closing already, you're, that you're not really going to be eligible. You'll have to work with the province to sort that out. And they'll guarantee up to 5,000 a month for the three month period if that business goes under. They've also put together these draft agreements. And as, as I said, uh, under the original program, franchise businesses were not eligible, but that has since changed. So the only exclusion is corporately owned franchise locations. So if there's a Tim Hortons or a Second Cup, et cetera, that is corporately owned, they would not be eligible for this. But if it's a franchisee, they are eligible. And then they've got some emergency bridge funding for workers that have been laid off and a few small business grants. In terms of PEI, PEI has quite literally copied and pasted the commercial lease deferral program from Nova Scotia. Uh, I am, unfortunately for me, they took the, the old version that prevented franchisees from taking advantage of the program, but that should be changing in the next day or two. I've been speaking to a number of people out in, on the island, and so that should be changing. They also have a number of advice programs. So this is if you need to hire a business consultant to go work through how your business will change. They've got a program that's available, capital financing to help some of PEI small businesses and then some emergency income relief for people who are stopped working. And then we go to Newfoundland and Labrador. They're have, they have very limited fiscal capacity um, in Newfoundland and Labrador, so they don't have a lot of business support programs available. Most of it is focused on workers comp for people who have had to go into isolation and then they're relying on all of the federal programs. So if you're doing business in Newfoundland, there aren't a lot of supports available right now. And again, that's as of April 7th. So that could change at any moment. And that's, I'm just gonna go through some of the things we're working on next. Um, so some of the things we have been successful on, on the wage subsidy, we got it increased to 75% um, from the original 10%. So they're now those two programs. We've gotten the workers comp premium reductions, which may not affect a great many of you the sales tax remittance deferrals and the rate reductions. So that's good news for businesses across the country. And that keeps cash in your pocket today instead of waiting for government to write a check. Again, with the wage subsidy, we are trying to get that program, the 75% program changed, so it's more self-administered, but that's, that's on my to-do list. 
again, this is kind of our part of my to-do list about changes to these three programs, the emergency business account, again, expanding it out the wage subsidy, making it a little easier for business and the response benefit. This one will be relevant to a lot of you who pay, pay yourselves through investment income or shareholder type income or dividend type income. So where you would, you get issued a T5 every year instead of a T4. We're trying to get the emergency response benefit expanded to include those whose primary income comes from T5 income so that that way you're eligible for that program and can tap into that $2,000 a month for the next four months. I know a lot of, some of you may be not working because you can't get out, can't show homes or, or whatnot. So we wanna try and make it as broad a program as possible. And in terms of the other things we're working on is just this commercial rent deferral program, also trying to work with municipalities to forego property tax payments during the period and then getting some of the loan payment deferrals in place. Another big one we're pushing government on is trying to get the credit rating agencies to freeze credit scores. We don't want somebody's credit score, somebody who may be closed down have to defer rent because of a state of emergency and they can't open. We don't want that credit rating agency to drop their rating so that they have difficulty accessing capital moving forward. This is an extreme situation and we're trying to get government to work with credit agencies to recognize that. And then to help with the economic recovery, we are working to create incentives to and subsidies for new hires or to help bring people back. That will shorten the time frame that you have to have people, some of your staff who you may have laid off, bring them back into the office, bring them back doing work for you. And then also changes to the Canada Small Business Financing Program to open that program up again and allow for some working capital and allow other types of things to be funded, such as training fees, franchise fees, and some of those softer costs that are not currently eligible for that program. Because the CSBFP is more focused on hard costs, but moving forward, those soft costs are going to be more important in helping get business back on their feet. So with that, that's my contact details. I will, you know, flip me an email and or give me a call. That's my that's my cell number that I'm is sitting right in front of me right now. I didn't put my office line on because unfortunately I'm not in the office. I'm sitting at my dining room table. And then I do have a link to the presentation here. And if you would like, if you go to cfa.ca slash covid covid 19. That's the CFA's resource page, and there's a ton of information there about, I do a daily update that can go out to, that you can register for of just all the programs that are changing in government day by day across the country. We do regular webinars with franchisors, franchisees on a host of different topic, suppliers, et cetera. And I wrote my notes here, and I'll pass it. I guess Lee's probably got one or two questions have a number of questions, no fewer than 20 on one particular topic. So I'm going to ask this one. Let me know if you know the answer to it. We've got a lot of people who are saying, you know, I sold a house in January, it doesn't close till March, I don't get paid till April. Can these people qualify for the SIR? That is... Now, in a normal situation, when would that revenue, when would you report that on a corporate tax return if you're filing monthly? Would you report it when the deal closes, when the deal is signed or when the deal closes and you actually get the cash? That's an excellent question and I am confident that we will get lots of people commenting um, on this is, that. It's going to be based on when you, when the deal closes and you receive that cash. Now, keeping in mind, so if you do have that five, as long as you have 5,000 in income in 20, it's 2019, not 2018. So if you've got 5,000 income in 2019 and no income right now, then you are eligible for that CERB. Okay, so it does depend on when you would file the taxes on that. I hope when it closes and pays to the agent is what I'm being told. So. I guess they wouldn't claim it until April. We've got a lot of people saying that they've got, you know, pre-construction from two years ago that's gonna get paid out in April or May. So from what you're saying, I'm guessing they wouldn't necessarily qualify here? 
it doesn't sound like it, but if I could ask the one or two of those people, not all 25 of you, uh, to send me an email with a details of the situation. I speak with the federal government every morning at 11 a.m. So I can raise this issue with them and get some direction. Uh, we speak with the Assistant Deputy Minister of Small Business and some folks from federal finance and, and uh, social development Canada. So I can, get, I can get an answer to that question. Great, thank you. I know a lot of people would really appreciate that because we've heard it time and time again that this is where people are getting confused and they really can't operate their businesses right now because they can't leave their homes. Um, so they do want to qualify for this. Another question, can you get the CERB if you have pension income, even a very small amount, because we have a number of people who are partially retired, they do real estate to supplement, but they're pulling a little bit of pension income, would they qualify? If they are pulling pension income, they should be able to qualify. It's actually open to self-employed people as well. So my best advice would be to apply online and the folks at Service Canada will walk you through and they'll actually figure out online in real time whether or not you're eligible. So of the 960,000 people that applied yesterday, about 765 of them were approved. So there were people that were not approved because of their situation, but it's best to work through Service Canada because they may be able to go, they'll go through the nuance of your specific situation and be able to tell you if yes or no you qualify. But it, because it's a very broad based program, they cast a very wide net to cap, try and capture as many people as possible because they didn't want people to be running out of food, running out of money, not able to pay rent during what is probably the biggest economic crisis any of us have ever seen. And so they, they wanted, they erred on the side of helping more people than less people. Or at least okay, they... that was going to be my follow-up question because we have all of these little nuances with the various situations that people are putting there. So you would recommend that people go through Service Canada. Do you actually speak to an individual or are you simply putting in information online? You can do uh, anything you want. So there's phone numbers and they are taking phone calls. You can apply online, putting the specific. They've got a very simple, straightforward online form. I don't have the website memorized yet, but it's if you go, just Google Service Canada and it will pop up as the form. So it is a very straightforward process, but yeah, you can speak to somebody if you have a more complicated situation and walk them through what your situation is. They Normally they have a couple of thousand people that are manning or sorry, personing these desks. They moved people from all over government into processing these. So they moved, I think it was something around 15,000 public servants out of their normal jobs into call center type jobs so they could process as many claims as possible. Great. Someone, Allison asks, I run my business as a sole propri proprietor. Do I qualify for any business relief that way or do I have to be a corporation? As a sole proprietor, you will qualify for some of these loan programs. I'm assuming you have a business account with Canada Revenue Agency. If you do that, or a business account with a bank, you have it somewhat separated from your day-to-day -day personal checking account. So you should be avail eligible for it that way. Uh, if not, work with your bank. They will be able to sort out whether or not you're eligible. You are, as a sole proprietor, you are eligible for the emergency response benefits of the $2,000 a month uh, if you have lost income or if you had no income for the last 14 days. So you are eligible for that. That was, you're not eligible for employment insurance, but you are eligible for the CERB. And for the business loans, I guess it work with your bank and they'll be able to work you through the criteria. If they're telling you you're not eligible uh, at the end of it, give me a call or send me an email and I will raise that with the federal government because because these programs are working in real time, they, they do it on a very high level at first. And then as specific situations arise, they start to narrow down the program criteria and decide if somebody is in or out based on their specific situation. And they start to draw a firmer line in the sand. And we have a number of programs like, I'd say at this very moment, there are people at the Ministry of Finance in Ottawa 
actually having a discussion about whether or not how to deal with self-employed individuals and how can they get access versus not. And so it's a very real time. They may say no today and two days from now they've had the discussion and they may change the program criteria. And I, that is I, good information. We've heard from a lot of people over the course of the last three weeks of webinars, you know, their situations are so unique and they're not quite sure. And they're also worried that they're not going to qualify while this program is ongoing because of all this deferred income that by the time they need it, the four months will be up. A lot of these programs, so the $2,000 a month program is going to flow within I believe they've said five day, five to 10 days of the application being received. And it's done, it's if you're registered for online banking with CRA, which most people are. So if you're registered, you're, if you're approved for the CERB, that money will be in your account. Like if you apply today, that money is gonna be in your account, what is that, by Monday, Tuesday? Um, no problem. And even that's with the holiday weekend, like effectively the, Easter holiday has been, I'm not sure how they're doing it federally, but it's, they're going to be people working over the weekend. There's nothing is shutting down. They're going to continue to process claims until the last claim is done. Another question that is similar, but not quite the same. I know agents are likely to ask if a check comes in for a closing, can the office hold the check to collect CERB instead? If it's done by check, I would, so you you might be able to do that. I would caution that they have been very adamant that if they find people misusing the system, they will, there are going to be penalties in place for that. So they want to open as wide as possible, but if it, if people start getting as the, I, I think as the Minister of Finance said, a little too cute, they may claw it back and put penalties in place. So it's something uh, to be careful of. If it's a physical check, in most cases, you're, you may not be in the office. So you may not have, if you haven't seen it, or if you know it's coming in, but you haven't actually seen it, you might be able to do that. But I would just caution to be, to be careful how you do that. Great advice. Thank you very much, David. We've answered a whole bunch of questions. There were a lot of very similar ones. So if we didn't get to yours specifically, I hope answering some of the others will have helped. It was just because a lot of them were very, very close. We also had a ton of feedback, David. People say, thank you for clarifying all of this. You laid it out really well. It's making sense to them now. They found it very informative. So David, thank you so much. No problem. Thanks a lot. And again, if you've got follow up questions, feel free to drop me an email or give me a call and I will do my best to answer you or I'll point you in the right direction. Wonderful. We really appreciate all the work that you're doing and all the follow up you've promised for our people. Tomorrow, everybody, we will be back here and talking specifically about real estate and listing presentations. Doug Thompson will be here. We'll be here at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.